My name is Tom Holman, and I'm a product manager in G Suite working on our intelligence efforts. And I'm here today with my colleagues Vishnu Savaji from Docs and Paul Lambert from Gmail uh, to talk with you about what we've been building in the way of intelligence over the past year in G Suite. Specifically, we want to go a bit deeper on some of the announcements that you heard about yesterday from Pravakar in his keynote. And so before we jump in, I just want to let you all know that throughout the course of the presentation, you should feel welcome to enter any questions you might have based on the content at the slides Q&A link you see at the top. We'll be sure to save plenty of time at the end to answer any of your questions. So let's jump in. So first, fundamentally, why are we here today to talk about intelligence and assistance in G Suite? And it all comes back to the fact that over the past several years, Google has been making foundational bets in machine learning across our family of products. So starting by looking beyond G Suite, we've bet on this in some of our other core products. So for example, in search, we actually use machine learning at the heart of the core search ranking algorithm. So why does this matter? Well, a year ago, we announced that 15% of all search queries that we see every day are actually new. And so what that means is that we actually have to continuously evolve the quality of search and do so really quickly at scale in order to keep up with our users. Second, in Google Translate, we've been using a neural machine translation system which clearly has benefits in terms of the quality of, machine tr or the quality of language translation, but it's actually opened up the, the opportunity to do things that were never possible before. So in late 2016, Google announced that we had actually achieved a zero-shot translation. So what, is, what a zero-shot translation is, is if we've seen English to Japanese before and trained on that, and we've seen English to Korean before and trained on that, we're actually now able to translate directly between Japanese and Korean. This is critical to the user experience because if you think about the number of language pairs in the world, it opens up experiences for users that were never thought of before. And then finally, in Google Photos, if you've ever touched the product, you know that the core part of the user experience is that we cluster photos around faces of key people and pets in your life, and that also you're able to search for entities and places in all of your photos. This fundamentally changed the way users need to think about organizing. They no longer need to organize. They just need to search. So that's across Google. But where does this all come back to G Suite? Well, in G Suite, we've been placing a bet on trying to use machine learning to eliminate the mundane so we can help people really need to just focus on the creative work, the things that people are really uniquely positioned to do. So the way we think about this is all of the tasks that someone must complete in their work life slot along a spectrum, from the highly routine to the creative. And we're trying to automate away things, starting at the routine end, in order to elevate work. So we've been on this path over the past couple of years. And there are just a couple of things, a couple of examples that I'll walk you through in terms of where we've done this before we talk about where we're heading next. So first, on the left side of the slide, you see Smart Reply in Gmail, where Gmail suggests three potential replies for any inbound email that you get. This is very much beloved by our users, and Paul in a couple minutes will tell you a bit more about where this stands in terms of usage. Next is Quick Access in Drive, where because all of our products are cloud native, we're able to draw from signals across the G Suite family of products to attempt to predict what file you are about to need next so you don't actually need to search for it significantly reducing the time to get into the file that you actually need. And then finally, on the right side, is Answers in Sheets Explore, where we let any user ask a question of their data set just like they would ask another person, equipping users to do analysis they did not know was possible based on Google's strength and natural language processing. So we've done all of these things, and what I want to point out is that Based on some of Google's core strengths, we fundamentally believe that we're really well positioned to invent the next breakthroughs beyond these. So specifically, we see Google as actually having three key advantages, which will play out in some of the things you hear about from Paul and Vishnu. So first, all of our products are cloud native in G Suite. And what that means is we're able to use all of your latest and greatest data when delivering a key insight or helping you take action. You don't need to worry that things are stale or out of date on your desktop. 
Second, Google engineers have built custom machine learning hardware, or tensor processing units, or TPUs. And the latest generation of TPUs helps expedite machine learning both in model training and also at inference time. And in the former, that means we can actually innovate faster because we, we can reduce the timeline to train a model. And in the latter, it means we can squeeze the latency out of the product experience to deliver something that's buttery smooth. You'll hear more about that from Paul as well. Buttery smooth. And then finally is Google Scale, where we recently had seven, and I'm assuming you heard earlier this week that we're about to have eight products with over a billion users. And so why does that matter? Well, the process of building and scaling products to this level means that Google's engineering team has gotten extremely good at squeezing resource costs out of computationally expensive operations, which machine learning has in spades. So the question becomes, where are we heading next with this in G Suite? Where are we heading with intelligence? We've done a bunch of research with our customers and users, and we keep coming back to the thinking that the core user journeys for productivity in the workplace really end up clustering around three things. So specifically, they cluster around writing or content creation, reading or content consumption, and the meeting or collaboration. And so for the rest of this discussion today, what we actually want to do is go particularly deep on the first or writing. But I want to point out that some of the things that I've already talked about start to show how Google's placed bets across these. So Smart Compose was an early bet in writing. Quick Access and some of the offerings from Explore and the Docs Editor products are bets in reading. And then finally, we've done uh, Find a Time and Calendar, and Prabhakar announced yesterday that voice actions are coming to Hangouts Meet Hardware in the meeting area. So let's talk more about writing. So specifically within writing, as we've dug into this area, we've realized that there are two key problems that users have with writing in their work life. Specifically, it takes far too much effort to do the amount of writing that people need to do in their daily jobs as knowledge workers. And then second, it's far too hard to write well. Even if you put in the time, it's an error-prone process. So over the next couple minutes, you're going to hear, about, hear from my colleagues, Paul Lambert and Gmail, around how we're trying to reduce the effort with Smart Compose and Gmail. And then after Paul, you'll hear from Vishnu Savaji around how we're trying to help raise the quality bar with Grammar and Google Docs. And so with that, I'd like to hand off to Paul to talk with you about Smart Compose and Gmail. All right. Cool. So thank you, Tom. As he just said, my name is Paul. I'm a product manager in Gmail. And I'm going to be talking about writing in Gmail. Uh, so let's start with a show of hands. Who here wrote an email today? I, and I don't believe you who don't have your hands up. Um, so we all write a lot of email, right? We read a lot of email as well. A um, recent McKinsey store, uh, study came out saying that 28% of our average work days are spent in email. That's 650 hours a year. So we know that when we're innovating in email, we're addressing a high impact uh, part of a, a, a worker's life. And we think, we think we can make a big impact there, particularly on writing, because of course, writing an email takes longer than reading one. Um, so go back about two and a half years, we built Smart Reply. It was originally an inbox, uh, our other email product, and, and we brought it to Gmail. It's about a year and a half ago when I joined Google, this was my starter project, getting Smart Reply into Gmail. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the product, the way it works is when you get an email uh, and you're supposed to you need to reply to it, we offer three suggestions that are pre-composed. So a lot of times these suggestions are, are fairly simple, right? There are a couple of words, or yes, no, sure, what time. Um, but what this does is it takes the experience of hitting reply, thinking which one you want to write, or typing it out, fixing your typos, hitting send, and it turns into tap, tap, right? Tap the reply, tap send. Um, so this takes about like a minute or so experience and, and tightens to a couple seconds. Um, it's been really successful for us. So we uh, have, we said yesterday, we announced yesterday, 10% of all mobile replies are started with Smart Reply. And the reception has been really, really great as well. So Forbes uh, generally, generously said, uh, it is one of those features you find yourself using more and more until you're annoyed when you're in an app that doesn't have the option. And to that point, we also announced that we're bringing it to Hangouts Chat very soon, which is a really great fit for these types of short messages um, that you want to send really quickly. So obviously, we're very proud of this. And uh, we think we've done a great job. But we also, around the time we launched this, we, we did a study around what type of emails are the most difficult to write. 
And this may not be a surprise, but we had to do this study to show it to us. I'm going to go back to that one. Uh, that professional emails are actually the most difficult, right? Like when you're writing, say, to a boss or to the whole company or to a prospect, that's um, when you're really going to stress out about what you're going to write. And turns out most of those emails are not four or five words, right? They, they tend to have a greeting, a body, a salutation, and so on. So we kind of had to be tr truthful that there was something more there that we could do. And also, when we saw the headlines, and this was the headline from that Forbes article that the quote I showed you, starts with saying, never type an email response again. And like, smart reply is great for those circumstances, but the truth is, like I said, a lot of emails are longer than, than four sentences, so we couldn't really achieve this vision yet. So we had to ask ourselves, what, what would it take to do that? So we looked around the company, and we build uh, language completion products all over the place. Right? This is probably the most common, you guys I'm sure have all used it, uh, search autocomplete. So search autocomplete, completes your queries. Uh, it saved about 25% of typing. So users around the world type 25% less characters, quarter less characters. And maybe the craziest stat is it saves 200 years of time per day. So all the seconds saved across all users around the globe, that's 200 years, two and a half human lifetimes every day, thanks to this product. Um, so that's a pretty high bar, and we wanted to see what it would take to build autocomplete for email. Uh, when we put this out there, this was a very bold vision, right? Because email is unstructured. It's not just a query. The universe of possible options um, is basically unbounded. Um, some people might be familiar with autocomplete in code editors and things, other sort of structured environments. We hadn't really done this in a general way before. So I'm going to take you back a year and take you through the story of how we built Smart Compose. About a year ago is when we had the proposal. And this next slide I actually took from the first product proposal meeting that we had. This was before we'd built anything. We wanted to build the world's first general purpose phrase autocomplete. There was a lot going on here. Uh, but we wanted to type, uh, write whatever people were going to write before they write it, right? Bring it to their fingertips. And the value that we were going to create by doing that is users would translate their thoughts with lower effort and greater efficiency. As, we, as I just showed, we were trying to you know, uh, help with those more difficult, higher effort emails. So this is what we proposed. We got the green light to go ahead and, and explore some options. And the first thing we built was this demo tool that uh, would take an email and actually just took the smart, the smart reply model. And as we typed, it would it sort of drill down on those smart reply suggestions, and we could see kind of what it felt like. Um, and this was just pretty much just an engineering proof of concept, but we had enough uh, enough spark there that we wanted to go on and then and design a user interface for it as well. So this passed in August, went on to design some UX, and we looked at these three options. So first one on the left is complete, is very similar to autocomplete and search. Uh, we also use this in Chrome and other, other ones. Uh, it's a drop down. The real advantage here is we can be wrong, right? We can give you many options and the user can can choose what, what, what works best for them. The middle one, chips, is very similar to Smart Reply, which we already had shipped, there was consistency there, we, we knew that was working for Smart Reply. And then the one on the right is type ahead, which is simply gray text. Um, and the advantage there is it doesn't take up a lot of space, disadvantage is we have to, we have to get it right. Um, I'm going to ask you guys what you think you would prefer the most, even though some of you guys might know what we shipped, but how many of you, you think that this is the experience you would like to help autocomplete an email? Okay, I got one hand, two hand. How many people would like chips? That's actually a surprising number. It's said like maybe 10%. And then type ahead on the right. The majority of people. So it actually, that, so I'll tell you what the actual results were. This was like so-so. Um, the main cost there was that people were reading all three suggestions. So it was taking them out of the flow of writing an email. Um, and, and that actually sometimes slowed them down, which is obviously very counterproductive. This one bombed. So chips was really, really bad because what happened was people would stop writing and read the suggestion and then move their mouse. So it was just this very interruptive experience. Um, but type ahead worked really well. When it was right, people felt like they could accept it. And when it didn't, they kinda, it kind of just got out of their way. And so the cost of being wrong was really, really low. Um, so having proved the engineering proof of concept and, and finding UX that we believed in, we then uh, moved forward to actually build it out, build it out in product. And the first way we did this is through a Chrome extension, and that's a bit of a detail, but it made us move quicker. Uh, and this is a screenshot from our actual first Chrome extension and uh, the Smart Compose experience. So one thing I want to talk about now is just very quickly sort of the product development process. Right? So it's fairly simple, um, but it's hard to execute properly. Uh, understand the user problem, define success, and then iterate. And I've already talked to you about what the user problem was. Right? We know people are spending a ton of time in email. They're struggling with professional email. 
And we talked about design, build, evaluate a little bit. We designed some stuff, we evaluated it in user studies. I kind of skipped over the second part, and that's really important. And it turns out in Gmail, that's really tough. Uh, because, like, do you want people to spend more or less time in, in Gmail? Um, so I would actually, I'm curious, because I looked at the, the list of attendees here. There's a bunch of PMs and other people in this room who I probably spent a lot of time thinking about success criteria. If, if you had to, if any, I want somebody to shout out. If they had to pick a success metric, like one success metric for, for Gmail, for an email product, what would it be? Is it time in sight, email sent? What? What was that? A a faster response? Faster replies, faster response. That's a pretty good one. So time, time spent to compose an email. Any other ideas? How do we, like, so that works really well for the composition experience, which definitely applies here. Um, if we were to choose sort of one general purpose success metric for Gmail, what, what do you think that would be? Rapid accuracy. Well, how would you define accuracy? Rapid accuracy was the answer. How would I yeah. Uh, I guess aligning to what I was expecting and grammar and spelling. Um, so that's actually not so far off because. Okay, so I'll, I'll set what we actually, what we, what we generally do. And of course, there's many metrics we look at. But ultimately, what we're trying to dive is user happiness, which often is, is, is kind of the accuracy and how close we're matching their expectations. So this is one survey. It's a satisfaction survey. It's pretty straightforward. It says, how satisfied are you with this product? Um, or in this case, this is what we actually did for Smart Compose, the tech suggestions. Five point scale, ranging from very dissatisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, neutral, and two, two positive scores. Of course, isn't our only success metric, but ultimately, we're trying to make happy users. And this is kind of the best way we know right now to just measure that directly. So we did this initial version, and we were able to now start using that success metric because uh, we had enough users we could run these surveys, right? It wasn't just about a couple people in the lab, like with the UX studies. So we found 42% of people were very or somewhat satisfied. 30-something were in the middle, and there was like about 20% in the dissatisfied bucket. Again, show of hands if this is good. Would you, would you launch this product? Yes? Come on, it's twice as many people satisfied as dissatisfied. Yeah, so this is not above bar. Generally, the bar that we're looking for, oh, that one didn't come up. Anyways, the bar we're looking for generally is around 70 to 75%. So this had a long way to go, and, and definitely less than 10% dissatisfied. Um, so this had a long way to go, but we knew that we got a lot of learnings for the first experience, so we could act on. So here are a couple key learnings. Once we learned that speed matters, right? This sounds obvious, but it, was really, it came up very clearly in the feedback that if you're writing and you're going to suggest as a response, we have to be there as quick as you're thinking. Because if we're slow, it, we're just getting in the way. Second, triggering. What we mean by triggering is how often we show a suggestion. That when we're, I think I just got louder there. OK. Um, when we get that wrong, it can be very distracting. So the quality bar had to be, be high. But when we actually had enough confidence to show you something, and today in the product, we really bias towards only showing a suggestion when we're pretty confident that you're going to use it. Longer suggestions are more helpful. Again, this is obvious in retrospect. It wasn't at the beginning, which is that the more text we can insert, the more value that is, the more time it saves. So we cut down on sort of the, the number of short suggestions, single word suggestions that we offered. Finally, personalization is super helpful. right? People expect it to sound like them. And then third, we needed great onboarding. So the user experience of Smart Compose is you hit the tab key to accept the suggestion. Very natural once you learn it, but it's not sort of the first key you'll try. So people would just sort of struggle with how to use the product. So we did that, and we built internal version two. This is an example of the onboarding we came up with. So it shows a little tab icon on the bottom, shows you how to, how to use it. We implemented all those other things I mentioned, put it internally out in February, and we did another survey. And I won't make you guys guess what it is, but our results were significantly better, dramatically better. So 74% is basically at our launch bar. Uh, so this was a big turning point for the project, because now we knew we really had something here. That we, and we also, something I didn't show on the screen, we had some really passionate users, like random people from out the company emailing us and saying really, like, really great things, um, that they were saving them time, it was magic, things like this. I mean, truthfully, we also had people who weren't happy with it, but, um, but they were in the minority. Uh, so this is when we shifted our focus to productionization. So what would it take to make this really scale to Gmail? and have the quality bar that we hold for a, for a product that has over a billion users. And uh, what that meant was moving on to more dedicated hardware. And this calls back to the TPUs that, uh, that Tom was talking about. So move to TPUs to really hit on that speed uh, bucket. 
and then really prove, focus on improving performance and quality. And what I mean by quality is that if we're just training on all the emails that we have in, in the consumer emails we have in the system, you get some weird artifacts. Like, for example, one of the most common closings we had, and when I want to guess this, what do you think is the most common closing if you just let the model predict how you're going to end an email? It's sent from my iPhone. So we had to get, we had to get rid of that, um, obvious, for obvious reasons. But uh, anyways, so there was a bunch of small quality things, and uh, we, did, we did all that. I want to talk about the TPU impact. So in that first version, we were running on CPUs at inference. Um, we had, that was about 600 milliseconds of latency. And we knew from search and, and, and other products that 100 milliseconds is really kind of the magic bar, where when you're below that, it truly feels instant uh, to pretty much all people. So we wanted to get that below that. And we first went onto the TPU v1, because there, there were just more of them available in the data centers at the time. And we moved to v, v, uh, v1 for, or for our second version product. We moved to TPU v1. And it actually got us down to 80 milliseconds. This was a huge win. So this, combined with the survey results, knew we had pretty much a production-ready product. But what's even more amazing is we've recently migrated to v2, and we're actually down at 40 milliseconds, which is pretty crazy to think about, that we're running a model of this complexity at this scale at 40, 40 milliseconds latency. So when you use Smart Compose today, that's, you're running on TPU v2s. Anyways, back to our third version, did all that stuff, and our satisfaction was 82%. So this is when we felt like, OK, we've got something great here. Let's, let's give it to the world. And in May, at Google I.O., Sundar was up on stage, and at the beginning of the keynote, uh, in the first 10 minutes, announced uh, Smart Compose. And it was really exciting for all of us who worked on this to see this. And not long after that, we opened it up to our G Suite trusted testers. Um, the initial reception has been, has been really warm. So VentureBeat said it's basically like real-time autocomplete for your entire emails, which if you remember that slide I had from the first product proposal, that was kind of our vision. So it was very, very uh, rewarding to see that we were able to follow that through all the way to landing. Um, and some trusted tester feedback. So People saying, it's anticipating what I want to write next. Again, that was part of original vision, right? We wanted to bring to people's fingertips what they're going to write before they write it. And this next one um, is about actually non-native English speakers, which is something that's come up time and time again in this product, is that uh, non-native English speakers really find it beneficial. So this person said, it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. It completes my sentences. I can express myself without having to Google sample sentences, um, which, of course, is also really rewarding. And one thing we didn't really realize, kind of sitting where we do, is that there's almost two times as many people out there uh, using English at work who uh, are non-native English speakers than native English speakers. There's twice as many ESL, ESL speakers. So just to recap of how we grew this product and our satisfaction scores over time. We started at 42% our internal V1. We got up to 74. That's when we thought we knew we had something on our hands that was worth shipping. We iterated. We got it to 80, 82. And now, actually, just this week, we got back our trusted tester surveys, which are the latest version of the product. And this is the version that you guys will all get when it's turned on for your accounts. And our satisfaction score is up at 89%, which we're super happy about. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to just give you a couple headline features so you can all look, know what to look forward uh, to. So start with Smart Compose completes common phrases. This was sort of the value prop of smart reply, but we're generalizing it. Right? So this might be, please let me know if you have any questions. Hope to hear from you soon. Things that you've written hundreds and hundreds of times before, and you don't ever have to type them again. You're welcome. And uh, so not, but it's not only common phrases. It'll, it is also context aware. So what we mean is that it'll learn from the subject, the previous emails, if there are previous emails, sort of the, the domain of the conversation. So in this example, say, lease ending, uh, hey, Cameron, I'm George Hammond's apartment. It knows how to predict end of the month because it kind of knows you're talking about apartments. And if you think about it, there's thousands, actually, many, many thousands of these sort of domains and contexts that the model is able to learn because we are able to uh, train over large data sets. Um, and while this example is, I guess, kind of consumer, we also uh, work pretty well in enterprise, as you can see from our uh, trusted tester scores. So context aware. It also brings in personal information. This example is if you have your home and work address set in Google Maps. So it seems like a simple feature, but copy pasting your address and typing that out, making sure you get it right, is, is kind of just a really concrete pain point. People really like this. So as soon as you say, my address, our work address, our office, we'll bring that address right in, and uh, you can just hit tab to have that inserted, just as if you had typed it. And finally, we learn how you address your colleagues. So I might be, have a colleague named Daniel, uh, but he goes by Dan. 
We'll pick that up. We'll put that as a salutation when you start your emails. Um, and this works for uh, not just the names, but also like, hey, hi, hello, and so on. So here we go. That's Smart Compose. It is coming to all G Suite customers in the next couple of weeks. Um, this is sort of a GIF that kind of brings it all together. It was in the keynote yesterday. And if you have any more questions, or if you have any questions, I guess I haven't taken any. If you have any questions about how it was built or uh, what to, you can expect from it, we're going to have QA at the end. So with that, I'll hand it off to Vishnu. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Vishnu Savaji. I'm a product manager on the Docs team. And today I want to talk to you about correct English and correct uh, language correction. So you heard from Paul about how we're focused on making it easy for G Suite users to write faster. And what we found that it's not just enough to write faster, but it's also very important to write correctly, especially if you're at work. And so I want to talk through why this is important. And I'm going to give you one specific example about how we're approaching the space, which is grammar correction in Docs. So in our internal research, we've identified three use cases that we really wanted to go after with correct language. Um, high stakes internal communication. Imagine that you're about to send a document or a proposal to hundreds or thousands of users at your company. You wouldn't want your message to be diluted with a simple spelling or a grammar mistake. Next, when you're working with people outside your company, customers, partners, you're working on proposals uh, with the intention of sharing them outside. And finally, like Paul mentioned, collaboration as a non-native speaker. We found that several of our customers have users who did not start out speaking English, and they're just trying to get their work done. In all of these cases, it's not just important to write quickly, but also write correctly. So before making product investments, we wanted to understand what the critical user needs were. Um, and this helped us inform how we actually built out our product roadmap. And when we thought about this, we wanted to not just understand what the most frequent user needs were, but also what the most critical user needs were. So let me give you an example of a frequent user need, writing a sentence. It's probably something you do almost every day in some product. Uh, an example of a critical user need that's not so frequent is sharing a document with someone outside your domain and having that share expire after a week. It's not something you probably do every day or maybe every week, but it's really critical that you get that right. Well, we found that spelling and grammar correction aren't just the most frequent user needs, but also the most critical user ones. And we found that users, you know, if they weren't using a product to do this, if they weren't using Docs or Gmail to do this, they were manually doing this very often. And we found that it was something that our users were, were doing weekly. Uh, more than half uh, of the user base was doing this. So our assessment was there was a very high potential to address this overall pain point. Next, we wanted to understand what kind of relationship users wanted to have with these features. Here is a, uh, a bad scenario. Let's say we launch a grammar correction in Docs, and it just automatically corrects all your sentences as you type them out. You may not even be aware. In this scenario, the risk is that all of our users actually become worse at English over time, because they just rely on this functionality. So our biggest worry was, OK, are we building something that users will rely on as a crutch? In our internal testing and user testing, we found that all of this functionality was actually going to help make people better writers. And it, it's very interesting. Users are very inquisitive. When they come across a spelling or grammar correction, they don't just accept it. They, they try to understand more. And it actually helps them become better at their jobs. With Docs, we already have a foundation that we're starting from. Uh, we launched spelling correction in Google Docs in 2012. And the way that we've approached it is, is fairly unique. I'm going to talk through what we've done here. The neat thing about the system is that it leverages the power of Google Search, and in particular, a product known as the Googlebot. Googlebot is Google's web uh, crawling bot. And crawling is the process by which Google discovers new pages or discovers updates to existing pages on the web. And we then take this information and add this to the Google index. So what does this mean for spelling in Docs? Well, what this means is that our suggestions are contextual, and they get better over time. And let me talk through how. In this example, you'll see that I have a simple sentence. It's grammatically correct, but there are two spelling mistakes. 
And the interesting thing is that it's the same spelling mistake at the beginning of the sentence and at the end of the sentence. And we are smart enough to figure out what the right spelling should be in each of those cases. And you'll see that the two suggestions are actually different. And this is pretty subtle. If you happen to use docs and you just write, you probably don't even realize that this is what's going on. And this speaks to the power of leveraging Google Search uh, for this product. Next, you'll see that spelling suggestions are even noticed by docs if you're, the word that you've used is already in the English dictionary. In this example, ISLE, as in I-S-L-E, is already a word in the English dictionary. And several spell check products out there will just stop. They'll be like, OK, this sentence contains all words that are words in English, so I don't need to correct anything. What we are doing is we not only look at the words, but we look and understand, OK, is the usage of the word correct in that context? And so here, we're able to suggest ISLE as in A-S-I-L-E. Same pronunciation, different spelling, and that's the right word. And finally, our suggestions are constantly evolving. Uh, any language in the world is evolving every day. We learn new terms, and they get added to public knowledge. So as Google Search crawls the web, we see new words. And if those words become popular enough, they'll get added to our internal dictionary. In this case, we've learned that well I am is a proper noun, and it's not something that we try to correct anymore. And it's fascinating because well I am is a proper noun there is an interesting mix of punctuation and uh, capitalization. Um, so we, these are the kinds of complexities that we have had to account for when building this model. OK, so you all understand spelling correction and how we've approached it. Uh, grammar, we see as the next big leap in language correction. And we also see it as a very tough problem. With spelling, words generally exist in a dictionary. Um, I walked through a few special cases, but generally, uh, those rules hold. Grammar is more complex. It is a set of rules. Uh, it is a set of norms. And even within uh, a specific language like English, you actually have different, lang uh, different grammar between UK English and American English. And so it's just much more complex. Secondly, Grammar is subjective. Uh, we had all of these internal fights in the team when we were building this feature because people would walk up to me and like, they would say, Vishnu, you don't speak very good grammar. I don't trust you with this product. And I was like, you know what? You're absolutely right. Let's have some experts take a look at the problem. So we had professional linguists help us with this problem. And what we found is that we were able to quantify how subjective grammar is. Professional linguists agree on spelling suggestions almost all the time. But with grammar, they only agree about 75% of the time. And this means one out of four times, professional linguists who have grown up becoming experts in a particular language don't agree on what correct grammar is. So this made it even more complex to address this problem. And our assessment was, you know, we could go to market with a rules or heuristics-based approach, but this was a much better fit for machine learning. And that's what we did. We've taken a machine learning approach, uh, in particular, uh, a form of machine learning known as machine translation. And in simplest terms, machine translation is about taking phrases in, from one language and substituting for phrases or words in another language. The approach here, of course, we're not translating between English and another language. We're translating within English from incorrect grammar as a source language to correct grammar as the target uh, language. And the performance of this feature is really dependent uh, on the data that the models have learned from. So our first step here was to start by making sure that we were correcting basic grammar mistakes. Uh, in this example, uh, we're correcting for the usage of articles, which, is, which I would consider a basic grammatical mistake. Uh, and uh, it's about using uh, uh and the uh correctly in English. With this model, you could have solve this problem with a rules or heuristics-based approach. But we wanted to do better. We wanted to scale to support all the complexity of grammar in English. And to do that, uh, we had to improve on the model to address a sentence like this. You'll notice that there are two uh, grammar mistakes in the sentence. One of them has to do with the current uh, usage of tense for the word address. Does anyone know what the grammatical rule is that covers the other error? OK, so it turns out even I don't know this. Uh, and the amazing thing about grammar is you don't 
need to understand it, but it's a rule that governs the usage of clauses in English, and if, if I recall correctly, it's about the subordinate clause. It's very complex. I don't really know grammar, uh, as I already said. <laughs> so we had to scale to support this, and we in the team had a sense of, you know, we felt like the feature was improving but we really needed a way to validate that all these improvements were actually working. And so we took a process that was fairly similar to what Paul talked about. We started with a basic model, a model that could correct basic grammar suggestions. And then we rolled it out to more users at Google, uh, users who, were, who had previously not even uh, been exposed to the feature, and then we asked them what they thought. We asked them questions like, how satisfied were you? Did you find any uh, errors that the model made? Can you tell us examples where the model worked really well or really badly? And then we took this data and we incorporated uh, uh, this data into training a new model. And when we did this, we were very intentional about rolling out the model to a new set of users at Google who had never seen the feature. And the reason is because we found that features uh, like grammar have this problem where the first users are very biased by their lower quality experience. And so we found that we couldn't actually incorporate their feedback anymore. We had to expand to a new set of uh, users at Google. And so we did this uh, a few times. And in parallel, we also wanted to get the user experience right. And the interesting thing with machine learning features is that user experience is often not just as important, but more important than the models. Because the interaction and the satisfaction with the feature is highly dependent on how users are exposed to the functionality. And again, Paul talked through how they played with three different user experience options for the feature. Grammar um, was fairly simple. Uh, we settled on two approaches. The first one is contextual suggestions. You'll see blue underlines and docs, and those um, mean grammar suggestions. We also noticed that we had a separate set of users, and these were more power users, um, like people in communications or marketing. And they had a different method of writing English. They would write a very long document, and they would switch explicitly into a language correction mode. And so we built on an existing spell check tool, revamped it, and this basically allows you to bulk uh, accept or bulk reject suggestions in your document. The powerful thing about all this is that it's built right into Google Docs. You don't need to install uh, another tool. All your data stays within G Suite. And this means that it's covered by the G Suite Terms of Service. So it's reliable, safe, um, and meets all of your privacy expectations. OK, so to recap, we had a model that worked. We had settled on a user experience, and Googlers were telling us amazing things about the product. We wanted to make sure that we weren't just tailoring the model to Googlers. It's entirely possible with a problem like this that Googlers have a specific usage of grammar. And so we said, we really need to get some external feedback. So we launched a trusted tester program. A trusted tester program is where we take the feature confidentially to a few of our enterprise customers, and we ask them what they think. And we heard really positive things. First, users were just happy that the feature worked, and they were impressed with how we were handling complex use cases. For example, sentences or documents with several spelling or language, um, spelling or grammar mistakes. Next, we found that users were starting to learn. They, they were starting to get more deliberate about how they were writing documents. They were learning about grammar. Even if they weren't able to specify what grammar rule they were learning, they were learning how to use a suggestion and correctly write in the future. And finally, we found that this feature was empowering to, to the several speakers out there who collaborate in English but are not native speakers. And this is one that I'm personally very excited about, uh, the fact that we're bringing uh, a message of empowerment uh, to people at work. Grammar is available uh, as of this week uh, in the form of an early access program. If you go to that URL, g.co slash grammar EAP, you can sign up uh, for your domain to be part of this program. And we are collecting more feedback to help make this feature better. To recap, Smart Compose and Grammar Suggestions are just two ways in which we're using machine learning to help our users write with lower effort and higher quality. Stay tuned for more to come. <laughs>